Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. My name is Jesse Roman. Most Thursdays, I stand in front of you to discuss uh, historical events or historical figures who have changed the way we think about general biology, science, and even medicine and healthcare. And today is no different. Um, so before the lecture starts, let me remind you about a couple of people that I think are very important to remember. One is Edward Joseph Louis Marie Van Beneden. Dr. Van Beneden was a Belgian embryologist and cytology, and he was the first to, or one of the first to really describe uh, fertilization in sex cells. And he described how uh, the formation of a new cells were very much dependent on the transfer of chromosomes from a male um, sperm, a female egg. And he had a number of studies in embryology, and ultimately his theory of embryo formation in mammals became sort of a well-known uh, scientific principle. So, Dr. Edward Van Betten. The other person I want you to remember is Johannes Peter Mueller. Johannes Peter Mueller. Johannes Peter Mueller died uh, on this day back in 1858. 1858. And he was known as one of the greatest anatomists of the 19th century. With Magadi, he was known for establishing the science of physiology as we sort of know it today in its modern form. But he's best well known for the study of sensory nerves. And he described what was called today the specific nerves energies. This is in 1826, and he understood through his studies that if you stimulated a certain nerve, the animal will interpret that signal always in the same way, depending on the specialization of that nerve. So if you take the optic nerve and stimulate it, it would always be sensed as light, even if light was not used to stimulate that nerve. Okay, so that's important to remember. But he did multiple studies in hermaphroditism and embryology and echinoderms and fish and blood uh, and even in the mechanisms of voice. On this day, back in 1932, was the first announcement that there was a vaccine for human use against yellow fever. It was announced during the meeting of the American Societies of Experimental Biology in Philadelphia. Um, and it was uh, put together by a group of people who were sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, when I bring these things up, I usually, um, I, I sometimes worry that you get the impression uh, that these people lived decades, perhaps centuries ago, and that it was those times that allowed the world to generate those kinds of individuals, that there was something special about the times. And, and I think the point that we bring every Thursday is that these were ordinary men and women who actually spent a lot of energy sacrifice a lot, even from their families, even their own security and lives, to be able to accomplish something and to change the way we look at medicine, patient care, biology, science, and so forth. And so today, what I'm going to do is talk to you about one of these people who lived in our times, just died in 2009, so that you begin, particularly our young trainees and our junior faculty, to understand that this is less about the times we live in and more about the drive, the passion, the willingness of sacrifice, and the talent of individuals. And to understand this individual, we're going to read a lot of quotes. So this will be a very different presentation than usual. I'm not going to talk about a specific scientific topic. I'm not going to tell you about a scientific method. I'm not going to talk much about mechanisms of action. In fact, I'm going to read a lot of quotes. Because I believe that understanding a man or a woman is better through their own words than through mine, being the interpreter. Okay? So why don't we get started? Let me make sure that I have... Here. Okay. So we're going to talk about Tom Petty. Before that, I want to. This slide always has problems. As you can see, I have nothing to disclose. There's a lot of stuff here, but as you know, I, I'm engaged in a number of clinical trials with my colleagues in the area of pulmonary fibrosis with a number of industries. Uh, these are all grants for clinical trials. I'm not involved in any speaker bureaus. And of course, I'm involved with uh, research funded by the NIH and the VA. So we're going to talk about Tom Petty, tales from a father-grandfather pioneer and a self-characterized oxophile. Now, I'm not talking about this Tom Petty. I'm talking about this Tom Petty, who was born in 1932 until 2009. How many of you know who I'm talking about? 
a few of you know who I'm talking about. Well, good. So at the end of this lecture, all of you will know a little bit of Tom Petty. But I'm going to start with a case because you know that I like to start Grand Rounds with a case. I want to remind you when you bring your speakers, please present a case so that there's uh, some relevance to what we do day in and day out. Mr. X has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. He's treated with bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. He was prescribed supplemental oxygen, but he doesn't use it for over two years. He developed cough and increased shortness of breath over the past few days, presented to the emergency room where he was found to have moderate respiratory distress. He showed low-grade fever. He was coughing a bit. Lung exam revealed very distant sounds. They couldn't hear hardly any wheezes. It was a prolonged expiratory phase, and there was leg edema noted. Blood gases showed significant hypoxemia. And the patient was admitted with the diagnosis of acute exacerbation of COPD. I have three of those in the ICU uh, at the VA just this week. Likely related to acute bronchitis, but also heart failure. He appeared to improve over the past couple of days with duonebs and IV steroids and uh, giving him this and that, but then developed aspiration. And in fact, developed what appeared to be aspiration pneumonia, severe respiratory distress, was put on a BiPAP machine, did not recover much, sent to the medical intensive care unit, will ultimately require intubation and mechanical ventilation. In a few days, developed bilateral infiltrates, refractory hypoxemia, and was diagnosed with acute lung injury, and ultimately succumbed by this by after two weeks of being in the hospital. Now, I have given you this presentation in less than 60 seconds, and I suspect Almost everybody in this room understands every aspect of what I discuss. What you probably don't know is that the reason you understand this is because Tom Petty and his colleagues had a hand on describing this to you over the past few decades. From the concept of blood gas to hypoxemia to the treatment of long-term oxygen therapy to development of the definition of COPD to acute lung injury. Tom Petty has his hand in all the above. And it's for that reason that high scholars or people that I really consider expert academicians today consider him most outstanding lung doctor of his generation, perhaps of any generation. The fact remains that there is probably no one in pulmonary medicine that has done more patient care than Tom Petty, more for patient care, and that Tom Petty invented pulmonary medicine as we know it today. Okay? So the pulmonologists in this room know Tom Petty, but it's more than just knowing what he did for pulmonary medicine. It's knowing what he did for academic medicine and our understanding of our ability to accomplish beyond what our job description entails. So he's considered today the grandfather of COPD, the father of modern pulmonary medicine, pioneer in COPD in education, and he described himself as an oxophile, and I will describe that a little bit later in my presentation. I want to tease you a little bit by telling you that there is a connection between Tom Petty and Kentucky. Now, I don't know how many of you know that connection. Raise your hand if you think you know that connection. One person, okay? The person I expected to know that connection, Harvey. But I'll get back to this in a minute, okay? So Tom Petty was always obsessed about this tobacco-related lung disease. And one of the things that I'm going to describe to you is that as a student, we're marked by something. We're exposed to people or to patients. Somebody tells you something. Something hits you. And throughout your career, that concept continues to raise its head and drives you in interesting directions. And Tom was very interested in tobacco-related lung disease, probably because of the first experience he had with a patient. Now, I want to talk about COPD, just a couple of slides, although many of you know what I'm talking about, but I just remind you that this concept about emphysema and chronic bronchitis and asthma and how they relate to each other and how going to the right causes reversibility and going to the left, it's more irreversible airway obstruction, and that there's an overlap, so you will see some patients with asthma that don't improve with bronchodilators, and you'll see some patients with COPD who have tremendous reversibility and improve dramatically and that these patients have a significant number of pathologies within the lung. And I've shown here before slides of a patient with tobacco-related disease with six distinct pathological entities, ranging from emphysema to bronchiolitis um, and, and obliterative bronchiolitis and so forth. And here are two lungs, and I got these from, from a Tom Petty book. Actually, here you see a normal, nice, pinkish-orange Lung, and this is a lung of a smoker who developed emphysema with destruction of the alveolar septum, the parenchyma, creating these holes. Okay, no wonder our patient was short of breath and hypoxemic. And if you look at these, like Mustafa Freg, who's sitting right in front of us, who we recruited because he specializes in lung disease, uh, you'll see that a normal patient has these very fine 
beautiful structures, probably the most beautiful structures in the body. And, and how, when you smoke, you actually destroy these septa. You see these septa that are not aligned with the others. And by destroying these septa, you enlarge these air spaces. These are not normal air spaces that have been distended. They look distended because the alveolar septa that distinguish them from another have disappeared. What's in the alveolar septa? Vessels. When you get rid of the vessels, you have to transport the cardiac output through a limited number of tubes, and you develop pulmonary hypertension. So as your COPD and emphysema gets worse, and as you destroy alveolar septa, and as you get rid of your vascular architecture, you develop pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. And this is what our patient was presenting. And then you develop hypoxemia because you don't have vessels to transfer oxygen to. And that increases vasoconstriction, hypoxemia being one of the most potent vasoconstrictors available. All of this pathophysiology, you know this. You know this a lot because of the work of Tom Petty and many other people are working in this area over that time. And tobacco-related diseases are important to Kentucky today. This is not the link with Tom Petty, but this is a slide that you've seen before. I've told you before that the health index of this town of, in Kentucky is 47 out of the, all the states. And it has been around 47 since 1990 when we started getting health index. In a place with two huge health care, three health care systems, more than two medical schools, and many, 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 many doctors, our health index has not changed a bit in close to two and a half decades. And we remain the highest rate of smoking. We remain to have the highest rate of COPD. Louisville named worst U.S. city for allergies. Kentucky ranks first in toxic air pollution and power plants, highest in lung cancer rates, and one of the highest incidents in asthma. We need more Tom Petty's. We'll talk about why. So again, he had an obsession about tobacco-related lung disease. And, and as I told you before, we're going we're to read some quotes by Tom. I can still remember my trepidation as I was assigned my first patient to work up. You all remember your first patient to work up? I will tell you that I was kicked out of the room by my first patient because he was there not to be taken care of by students. As a junior medical student on the wards of the old Colorado General Hospital. This was in 1957. I introduced myself to a large man who said he had come to the hospital because he was short of breath, fatigued, and had headaches. I don't remember all the details of this history, but I recall that he was a heavy, heavy smoker. He had just put out a cigarette when I approached him. On examination, I was impressed with the blue color around his mouth. He was hypoxemic and probably was one of the blue bloater. And lips and his swollen ankles. This was his first patient. Patient that could have been the one I just described just a few minutes ago. Now, I will come back to this patient a little bit later. But let me just tell you a little bit about Tom Petty. He was born in Boulder, Colorado. And this probably has implications for what he wanted, ended up doing. Boulder was settled in 1858, had his first schoolhouse in 1860. Denver Boulder Railroad operated since 1873. There was a sanatorium there in business since 1896. And there were about 10,000 population in the 1930s. Remember, he was born in the early 1930s. So this is, I'm setting the stage for you for where this kid was born. So, this, so the previous slide is a, is a black and white image, and, and sort of it looks kind of bad. But I think if you look at this today, how it looks, it's not that very different. It has a huge stadium now. But notice how it's close to the mountains. And this is about 5,300 feet above sea level. And these have 83% of oxygen available at sea level. So this interest in hypoxemia was something that Tom Petty was living with throughout his life. And he mentions that I got really high after my freshman year in medical school at the University of Colorado. To be specific, I spent a summer in research and acclimatization to altitude in 1955. During this summer, I lived for one month on Mount Evans, located 14 1,260 feet above sea level. Our team was made up of four medical students and two faculty members of the Department of Physiology. So he had his first patient who was terribly uh, ill because of tobacco-related disease. And then he's beginning to understand hypoxemia, at least as it's related to a high altitude. Okay? But he was engaged in that, and that was exciting to him. He had, was influenced by a number of, of things. His father was a postal worker, but Eleanor, his mother, was a teacher. And she did not only interest him in reading, she actually pushed him to write. 
you will see at the end that this man wrote over 800 manuscripts and over 30 chapters. Mom got him to write, and he thought that was important to describe what he was thinking and these mechanisms of action very early on. His brother died in childhood, and his grandmother struggled with tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis is interesting because, remember, he's from Colorado, and there's Colorado Springs, the city tuberculosis built, this time when patients would flock to Colorado because the nice air, uh, supposedly, uh, was a nice place to be to get rid of tuberculosis infection. Julio will tell you differently. But you will see that basically this person lived most of his life around this area. He was born here. He, uh, Colorado Springs was nearby. He spent most of his professional life in Denver. And, of course, the Aspirin Lung Conference, which we'll talk to you a little bit later. He obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado in 1955, medical degree from the University of Colorado in 1958, Alpha Omega Alpha, first in his class. He was a smart man, completed internship at Philadelphia General Hospital, and completed residency at the University of Michigan. So his only time outside during training was to do his internship and residency. One point that I always like to make is this one. Suspended after performing bedside arterial puncture to determine blood gases in a patient misdiagnosed with polycythemia vera. Yes, D. Tom Petty, the grandfather of COPD, was suspended as an intern for not following the rules of the organization. Hmm? At this point, I was unsure about my future career and was vacillating between becoming a surgeon or an internist. Since I had no deferment during the Korean War, I applied for a one-year post as a resident at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, which was highly sought after. Fortunately, there was a vacancy, and I was accepted. Now, notice this. Michigan was a quite different place than Philadelphia. I had many, many levels of supervision. I was not free to function as a first-year resident in training on my own even though I thought I was pretty skilled. I had to be supervised in everything I did by a senior resident or fellow. This was actually good fortune because I needed the sanding off of my rough edges. Remind you of anybody? Okay. The attending physician often did not appreciate my energies and adventures as I pursued my training. I was too sure of my perceived, self-perceived abilities. This was a man who was a driver. He was going to make things happen, whether it was through the rules or not. And it's important for us to recognize that. I was suspended on the spot because I had not gone through the channels by obtaining arterial blood gas. So the protocol was that if you had wanted to do blood gas, you consulted a cardiologist, and the cardiologist set up a time to do this in the operating room. Remember, this is, this is not just so many decades ago, okay? So he, I was called on the carpet for not consulting and then for the procedure to be done. He did it in the middle of the night. So he went and got a little arterial tube and made it happen. In 1976, 15 years later, Tom Petty's known all over the world. He's called back to the University of Michigan, and he was given an award for the first arterial blood gas performed by a resident at the University of Michigan by William Robinson, the chair. Okay? I see Henry taking pictures, so I'll, I'll leave that there, Henry. I can pass this on to you. So he became a pulmonologist, thankful for that, and joined the faculty in 1963. He became division director in 1971, uh, replacing somebody who was very well known, Dr. Roger Mitchell. And this is something Bernard Levine, who you might, might know, said, when Tom Petty started work as assistant professor in the early 1960s, respiratory care was in its infancy, COPD was a disorder that was nobody wanted to talk about, and oxygen was poorly understood, inappropriately used medication. Tom Petty made the world aware of the importance of these disorders and their treatment. Tom Petty was also a master clinician. So this was not someone in the lab all the time. He was a clinician investigator, but clinician highlighted and bolded to him. And in fact, he wrote a book where the titles of each chapters are names of people. Tony, Joy, whatever. And this is with Joy. One of his patients, okay? And people know him. His patients adored him because he was wonderful with them. He developed patient support groups. Some of you think that this is very innovative. Tom Petty and many others have been doing this for years. This is some of these old pictures in the 1960s with his patients and with some of his colleagues in the laboratory. In 1962, I saw a most unusual patient at the Veterans Hospital during my pulmonary fellowship. He was a Marine veteran who had suffered from rapidly progressive shortness of breath. He began smoking at age 17. He was only 27. 
27, but had marked hyperinflation of his chest and very poor lung function due to emphysema. So he saw a young man who was a smoker who already before age 30 had emphysema. Along with my attending, we hypothesized that he must have some unique susceptibility to smoking. Some susceptibility, because we don't see emphysema until you're over 30, 40, and even 50 years of age. Why is this man so young getting emphysema? We could measure immunoglobulins these days, okay, those days. So we showed an absence of an abnormal alpha-1 globulin. And so what he did is he did the regular electrophoresis for globulin, and he showed that that patient was missing this. He didn't make the connection. He didn't make the connection. He was very close to making that connection. And the connection was that that is alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is a molecule produced in the liver that goes throughout your body, counteracting the effects of enzymes such as elastase. So when you smoke, you activate neutrophils and other inflammatory cells that migrate to your lung, become activated, and produce enzymes like elastase that begin to degrade the connective tissue of your lung. Hmm? Alpha-1 antitrypsin counters that. In the absence of that, you have too much degradation and emphysema. By the way, smoking is an acquired form of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency because it inhibits this enzyme that the alpha, inhibits alpha-1 antitrypsin. So this was just one year before Laurel and Erickson first reported on the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in emphysema in 1963. We did not make the connection ourselves. But perhaps today, that theory of the protease antiprotease that we all follow for the understanding of emphysema would have been through Petty's hands as well, because he was one year away from making this description. And being such a prolific writer, I would have been surprised that he didn't actually describe this as an abstract. I couldn't find it. Let's talk now, because I told you that our patient at the beginning and the patient that he saw were all hypoxemic and that oxygen had been prescribed to the patient I presented to you, but he was not using this. And Tom had a significant role in our use today of long-term oxygen therapy. He became a pulmonologist and joined the faculty of University of Colorado in 1963, just, a portable, just as portable oxygen canisters developed by the U.S. space program were entering commercial use. So Tom Petty makes available the use of chronic oxygen therapy to patients. Okay? But things were coming together at the same time. The U.S. space program had developed these space tanks, and he had availability to do this, and there was something else. Petty recognized that the new compact equipment could be used to administer oxygen at home. The research team led by Petty provided oxygen therapy to six people with severe COPD. Why did he need to test this? Because in those days, physicians feared giving oxygen to patients with COPD. Because if you give them too much oxygen, you retain CO2, they lose consciousness, and they die of respiratory failure. So nobody wanted to give these patients of oxygen. And Tom believed very strongly that it was oxygen, the very thing they needed, and that they were dying without it. So he studied six patients. After one month, the patients became less tired doing physical activities. RBC count decreased. They no longer had um, high hemoglobins. By performing blood gas measurements, Petty showed that there was no buildup of carbon dioxide. That was crucial because that was people, what people feared. Okay, in 1970s, Petty helped plan and conduct a federal trial with multiple patients, over 230 patients with COPD and chronic oxygen, and showed that the longer you use your oxygen, the higher the survival. As of today, nothing, no medication is better for patients with COPD than oxygen when they need it. And it's a drug, and we shouldn't hold it, and you don't get addicted to it, like people tell me. Tom Petty did that. As serendipity dictated, my boss had the first portable liquid oxygen prototype. You have to be in the right place at the right time. His boss had the portable liquid oxygen prototype device given to him by Lindell Corporation in New York. My assignment was to see how it worked and to learn if patients could benefit from long-term oxygen therapy. I will remember the hissing sound of filling the liquid canisters from its reservoir source on the floor way back in 1965, just 43 years ago. It was easy to carry this oxygen around. It weighed only 9.5 pounds. Two fellows and I, along with Nurse Lewis Nett, and I want to point this nurse because until the day he died, this person was his nurse. She was with him all the way through all the clinical trials. If you look at his papers, you often will see 
N net uh, next to it, L net next to it, designed to study to evaluate the effectiveness of oxy in improving patients. These were the same factors that were present in my pa first patient and the man in Michigan. He found that they had advanced stage of osteopathy, uh, excess blood formation, right heart failure. These were all the same findings that he found in his first patient. And the patient in Michigan described with polycythemia vera, which he knew was COPD, and described by showing that they had hypoxemia by doing the first blood gas, and for which he was suspended. Okay? The other thing he did is in Colorado, as you can imagine now, now you prescribe oxygen and somebody pays for it. But that was not the case then. When you have a new therapy, somebody's got to prove that this works for Medicare or whoever was then uh, decides to do it. So what he did is he brought a patient and he brought the medical records, okay, to the office of the director of social services. And he brought medical records before oxygen and medical records after oxygen. And he said, you make the choice. Here's how much you can save if you were to give oxygen to patients who need it. Hmm? And today, we don't need this. Tom Petty. Now, Tom Petty was also recognized very early on that emphysema and many of these COPD-related disorders were irreversible. And that all you can do was, like my colleague Rob Perez says, is build the body around the lungs. And that he needed to engage people in this process of pulmonary rehabilitation. I won't talk much about that, but he wrote a lot about that for respiratory therapy and other journals. And he worked hard to get respiratory uh, pulmonary rehabilitation on the map. Now the Kentucky Connection. Remember I told you there was a Kentucky Connection? I have to read you a quote because I think it's fascinating. I had just completed a very pleasant five-day fishing trip. Any of you who knew Tom Petty know that he loved fishing. Harvey, he would disappear for weeks off to somewhere in Canada or Alaska to fish. Balance. Balance, work and life, huh? Fishing trip with my family and arrived home on a late Sunday afternoon to hear the telephone ringing. I answered the phone as soon as I could, could to hear of somewhat irate Phyllis George, a former Miss America, and then the wife of John Brown, the governor of Kentucky. She complained bitterly that I was one of the most difficult people to ever, that she tried to reach. I said something like Miss Brown or Miss George, he couldn't remember there is no way that I can come to Kentucky tomorrow with the backlog of work that I have waiting for me in the morning. By the way, in those days, it was also difficult to reach Kentucky by plane. She answered with a very irritable, vo irritable voice that raised several decibels about her usual tone. Dr. Petty, do we have a bad connection or is there some reason that you cannot understand me? Needless to say, Tom packed up and came to Kentucky. It turns out John Brown was the governor. I don't know if some of you remember this history. Had had a cardiac, uh, had a uh, coronary artery surgery and developed uh, respiratory failure after the surgery and moved into the ICU because of acute lung injury. And she had read one of the papers of Tom Petty that I'll we'll describe next about acute lung injury. And so he was in the news talking. This person was at University of Kentucky. And he gave a press conference those days saying that this was a bad disease, but it was potentially reversible and the, the governor would uh, survive this. Uh, but it was something intriguing that I also found. During my many conversations with the governor that followed this, the question about the need for specialized care facilities for critically ill ventilated patients came up. In other words, if the governor were to remain on a ventilator, what do I do now? Who takes care of me? The governor decided to investigate the possibility, triggered by Tom Petty, of launching a special care facility for the catastrophically ill-ventilated dependent patients. He became one of the co-founders of Venker Hospital System, today known as Kindred Next Door. Two connections with Kentucky. So the governor had acute lung injury. What is acute lung injury? It is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. What Asbark and Petty described in 1967 was a syndrome of patients that developed very quick respiratory failure, where their x-rays showed bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. They had refractory hypoxemia. In other words, that they could provide them 100% oxygen and ultimately had to be intubated because there was no way to oxygenate these patients. And that it was not related to a cardiac defect. This was non-cardiogenic 
Crohn's disease and also had low compliance of the lung. In other words, the lung became rigid. This is now part, not part of the definition anymore. But he called these patients as acute respiratory distress syndrome. In fact, he called them as adult respiratory distress syndrome in those days. Okay? Now, think about how many cases of these we see a year. Do you know how many COPD cases my, my students at the VA are now saying, oh, we know, we, he's asked us uh, multiple times. Uh, there are about 15 to 20 million cases of COPD. There are about 15 million cases in the United States of asthma. There are about 50 to 55 million smokers. There are only 200,000 cases of acute lung injury a year in this country. 200,000. The problem is that it can happen in old and young, in men and women, and it kills 30 to 40 percent of these patients. These patients, 30 to 40 percent of them, will not come out of the hospital. So this is, a, this is an important entity. My offer to join the faculty of University of Colorado was 2500 bucks. Those new young faculty looking for, or young trainees looking for jobs just asked for 2500 bucks for a package to buy blood gas equipment. He wanted to buy blood gas equipment. Remember, he studied that in a summer when he was a student. He, he learned that that was important for patients. And 250 square feet laboratory. Uh, had a little sink and a little running water. That was good for him. This was less than two months after I completed my chief residency year following my pulmonary fellowship. Dave Ospart was the chief resident. Ospart and him were the ones who described um, acute lung injury. Some of you, some of the, our trainees develop a great relationship with trainees in surgery. This was a great relationship, a team, okay? We were both frustrated over our inability to deal with the problems of acute respiratory failure that we occasionally encountered. The inadequate ventilators, including the drinker tank negative pressure machine, the BIRD, how many of you remember the BIRDs? Bennett Ivory machines, they were not good for treating respiratory failure. At this point in my career, blood gas analysis was limited to research applications, but he had a machine. We desperately needed blood gas measurements and our sick patients to be able to monitor what was going on. I finally was convinced that I could do them. As I walked home that day, I was kicking a stone and singing, I can do blood gases. I'm not going to say the rest. <laughs> I need to read you these quotes because it's fascinating. When, when you read these quotes, you say, huh, that's why we think about these things these days. A few days later, one, one cold Saturday morning, I remember walking across the parking lot between New Colorado General Hospital and the VA Hospital. Some of you have been to Colorado and Denver. You know that they were just next to each other. You just cross uh, the street to get there. We talked about this new patient and his original patient with traumatic injury when he first used the angstrom respiratory and positive respiratory pressure. They were the first to use PEEP. First to use PEEP. Something is different with these patients, we agreed. Later over coffee, we concluded that the common denominator was southern diffuse and usually symmetrical pulmonary infiltrates following a variety of seemingly unrelated lung insults, stiff lungs requiring high inflation pressures, and marked difficulties with oxygenation. A definition of acute lung injury right there. Mm -hmm. The pulmonary edema that is associated with heart failure was different from this pattern in a material called hailing membranes, Dr. Mustafa, hailing membrane, which represented original pertinaceous fluid lying the collapse of viola. He's given you the clinical and basic and histological description of acute lung injury, something we've known since 1967. He worked a lot in this area. He, this, he has his his glass, gas machine, some of you have been in, in the laboratory. It looks very different now, but trust me, it's not that much different. He submitted that first work with some patients to a number of journals, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, American Journal of Surgery. Nobody wanted this. In fact, the editor would look at it, and it, within a day, without email those days, he would know that this was not accepted. Finally, in desperation, we sent it to the paper to Lancet. I guess in those days, Lancet wasn't that great. Okay, and received word within two weeks that our discovery was of such importance that it would be published as a lead article without delay. And that's how this publication got out there. Let me tell you a little bit about Tom Petty. The reason we know a lot about him is not because of his books. It's also because of all the papers, over 800 manuscripts, 30 books, hundreds of book chapters and editorials. He was a master clinician, as I told you before. He was the head of a training program for a number of years, the largest training program in pulmonary medicine in this country for decades, organizer and founding president of the Association of, of uh, Program Directors. Uh, he, was, he had a, a, a site called Ask Tom, later on become a website where patients can actually uh, go in 
and ask questions, and Tom would answer. Tom would answer when he could. Uh, he developed multiple books and pamphlets. He was division director, founding member of an NHLBI um, uh, program related to COPD education, president of the American College of Chief Physicians, and I can go on and on and on. He arrived at 5 a.m. every morning, which I was thankful for. I'll tell you why. And he spent two or three hours writing every day before he rounded. Every morning, he was at the desk, 5 o'clock in the morning, writing for two or three hours before he started rounding. You cannot be accomplished as Tom Petty if you don't sacrifice something. These are not extraordinary people. These are ordinary people that know how to sacrifice and spread their passion. Rigorous discipline. And he told me once, he said, Jesse, we have to stay ahead of the game. So uh, what, is, what do I mean by that? I think Tom invented the airport interview. When Tom was in charge for, for the past two decades of his life, he was really in charge of a number of committees by the NHI, NIH, and other organizations. And he would basically, if he was running the meeting, it had to be in a place that had easy access through airplane, and the meeting had to be held in the airport hotel so that you could come in and out. And Tom would tell me that he would be always an hour to two hours ahead uh, in the flight. He never lost a flight. He was always there. He brought work with him. He was always ahead of the game. He said, Jesse, to stay in this business, you always have to stay ahead of the game. And another story I will tell you is that I met Tom in 1986, 87, 85, I think, when I uh, was looking for a fellowship. And I was a resident, and I was looking for a fellowship, and I chose one week to go to WashU and to go to Colorado. But I mistakenly thought the wrong date that they gave me. So I was supposed to be a Tuesday in WashU, St. Louis, and I was going to be on Thursday interviewed in Colorado. But they had me coming in on Tuesday. So I arrived in Denver, Colorado on Wednesday afternoon. I called Tom Petty's secretary, and I said where I am, and he says, you were supposed to be here yesterday, Dr. Roman. We may not be able to meet you tomorrow. And I said, I, how can that be? There must be a mistake. Dr. Roman, I have done this for Dr. Petty for close to two decades. I don't make mistakes. <laughs> but I'll see what I can do. Note that some of the attendings that interview residents are not around tomorrow, and know that Dr. Petty is leaving out of town tomorrow, but I'll see what I can do. Within an hour, she called me and says, you better be, Tom Petty arrives at 5, you better be in the parking lot at 6 o'clock in the morning. Tom will take time from his busy schedule to come see you, and I've arranged for you to see five attending and so forth. And needless to say, I was at 5.15. I was in that parking lot, uh, and Tom arrives in a little old sports car. He was as kind and generous as you can imagine. You would never think that it was the powerhouse that you see here today. So because of him, they developed now what's called the Tom L. Petty Lung Conference. And it used to be called the Aspen Lung Conference because it was held in Aspen, Colorado. It was established by Mitchell, his predecessor as division chief in 1957. But it became fiscally strapped, and Tom really kept it alive. He really got enough resources from the university and others to keep it alive. And conference became the premier pulmonary scientific conference in the world. And, in fact, every June, pulmonary people flock from all over the country and from all over the United States and the world to discuss topics from acute lung injury to lung transplantation to asthma, immunology, and whatever you want to talk about. In 1990, it became the Thomas L. Petty Lung Conference. Few awards. Gold-headed Kane Award of Top Graduate Student, University of Colorado Silver and Gold Award for Excellence, Distinguished Service Award from the American Thoracic Society, uh, Annual Award of Excellence from the American Society of Respiratory and Cardiovascular Rehabilitation, Master Fellow of the ACCP, Master Fellow of the AARC, Senior Fellow of the Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, Legacy and Pony Medicine Award, Tom Petty Master. There's an award in the ACCP in name of Tom Petty and, of course, an endowed chair in his honor as well. Today, medicine is in crisis, Tom said. We spend too much money on so-called health care and little on prevention. Care has become technically oriented, impersonal, and not accessible or affordable to many. Far too many errors occur in hospitals and doctors' offices, sometimes leading to death. This is way before the... Um, discussion on medical errors and so forth. Tom Petty said that. 
as his perception, being a uh, president out there. He was separated from his wife, Carol Petty. He died at age 76 at his home in Denver after 10 years struggle with cardiac disease and pulmonary hypertension, 13 days before his 77th birthday. By the way, Tom always said that he would die on the same day, the same uh, calendar day of his birth, and he did. He is survived by his daughter, two sons, and eight grandchildren. He who had played a pivotal role in home oxygen therapy in the 1960s would spend his last years tethered to a catheter and a concentrator. So he wrote this book called Adventures of an Oxophile. And he called himself an oxophile because he was dependent on oxygen. Oxophile is something that has high affinity for oxygen. And he was hospitalized multiple times. And, and so... He wrote this thing that he learned about being a patient. He had written all his career about being a doctor and how to take care of people. Now he's talking from the other side. Everyone who enters a hospital has fears and personal needs. The right to privacy and self-determination must not be ignored. Even though a physician is transformed into a patient by disease, he continues to utilize his medical knowledge. That must be recognized. That must be recognized. A person who has had a brush with death can withstand almost anything once aware that he or she has not died. Encouragement for friends, family, and people providing health care really, really matters. And hope is the major driving force to recovery. So what are his legacies? Now, we've learned everything we've learned about medicine, but think about the people that are still creating Things because of Tom. There are four presidents of the American Thoracic Society, two Trudeau medalists, which is the highest medal, highest honor provided by their organization, six chairs of internal medicine, actually seventh now, seven, nine division chiefs, and currently 26 or more professors of medicine remain active. All, and many of them, all of them will tell you that Tom Petty was their mentor. This was the Pullman Division in 1970s. Today, I think the Pullman Division is over 140. The last time I talked to the division chief there, they, they, they lost count. Okay? It's one of the largest divisions in the country, and for many years, as I told you before, was considered to be the premier Pullman Division in the world. I'm going to leave you with this quote, so we have time to chat, by Mike Asman, one of his dear colleagues, an expert in chronic lung disease and tuberculosis, because it, it, it then brings you back to the man. And the point that I want to make today about... These are not extraordinary people living in times that allow things to happen. These are ordinary people that seek adventure, seek new things, are willing to sacrifice, are passionate about it, make it happen independent of the times they live in. Dr. Petter was bigger than life character. He enjoyed many professional friendships around the world. But those who were fortunate enough to work with Dr. Petty over his decades here in Colorado were singularly blessed. Whether it is at a view box discussing a complex case, telling one of his innumerable jokes, or describing a big rainbow trout that did not get away, his image will, in, will be an enduring inspiration. His career is a testament to the adage that the greatest gift is giving to others. This is Tom catching one of those fishes. And I remember being in one of the uh, um, Aspen Lung conferences, watching at a distance in a lake, Tom Petty catching a fish. And while I'm looking, I look around me, and there are like 20 of these superstars just watching for a few minutes this giant of the 1900s. Thank you.